بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله uh, This is going to be our first microbiology lecture for the respiratory system module and it's going to be about the respiratory tract uh, infections So to start uh, off we're going to talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system So the respiratory system uh, or the respiratory tract is a major portal of entry for infectious organism and uh, it is divided into three tracts, upper, middle, and lower. And in uh, other resources, we can find that the uh, respiratory tract is divided into upper and uh, lower uh, divisions only. So the uh, divisions are based on the structure and function of each part. The three parts have different types of infections. So the upper respiratory tract includes the mouth, nasal cavity, sinuses, and pharynx. And uh, infections are fairly common in the upper respiratory tract, uh, uh, usually nothing more than uh, an irritation. The middle respiratory tract includes the epiglottis, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and bronchial. And most of the infections in the uh, middle respiratory tract is uh, caused by viruses. Also, we have the lower respiratory tract, which includes the lung and the alveoli, and infection in this part of the respiratory tract is called pneumonia. And the infections are more dangerous since the lower respiratory tract is a sterile environment uh, in comparison to the upper respiratory tract, which has normal flora or microbiota, which occupy the upper respiratory tract. And uh, the lower respiratory tract infections might be difficult to Treat. So if we want to talk about the other way to uh, classify or to uh, divide the uh, respiratory system, upper and lower. So the upper include the uh, mouth, nasal cavity, sinuses, pharynx, epiglottis, and the part of the larynx above the vocal cord. The, pa the part of the larynx which is below the vocal cord, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, lungs and alveoli are all considered within the lower respiratory tract. So the most accessible system in the body is the respiratory system because uh, we breathe uh, uh, directly into the uh, lungs and this could have uh, potential infectious pathogens within the uh, air that we breathe. Uh, but the body has a variety of host defense mechanism to defend the uh, body against the pathogens which might be present in the uh, air. So we have the innate immune, immune response and adaptive immune response. Innate immunity or non-specific immunity and we have the adaptive immunity or the specific immunity. Uh, upper respiratory tract is continuously exposed to potential pathogens and uh, what are the defense mechanisms that we have in the uh, upper respiratory tract? We have the nasal hair, we have the, uh, muco uh, the mucus within the upper respiratory tract which can uh, trap the pathogens. Also we have the uh, humeral part of the immune system which is the IgA antibodies which are present in the secretions or in the mucus within the upper respiratory tract and which can uh, defend the upper respiratory or the respiratory uh, tract against uh, invading pathogens. Uh, lower respiratory tract is essentially a sterile environment as we said the lower respiratory tract is a sterile environment the upper respiratory tract is not a sterile environment. We have some microbiota or normal flora which live in there uh, which lives there in harmony with the uh, human body mostly does not cause harm or infections for the carriers of these microbiota or normal flora but they can transmit it to others once they get into contact with them and we're going to talk about the types of normal flora or microbiota present in the upper respiratory tract in the coming slides. 
So the normal floor of the respiratory tract generally limited to the upper respiratory tract, uh, mostly composed of the gram-positive bacteria, streptococci and staphylococci. These are the most uh, common uh, normal flora which are present in the uh, oral and nasal cavities. Uh, disease causing bacteria are present as normal flora and can cause disease if their host becomes immunocompromised or if they are transferred to other hosts. So it's living in harmony with the human body. If the uh, person becomes ill or immunocompromised or takes uh, drugs that compromise the immune system or he becomes chronically ill such as uh, infected with HIV, uh, cancer, uh, taking uh, anti-cancerous agents, so he might become uh, more prone to infections with these uh, normal flora. Also, patients who have these normal flora living in harmony with his body can be infectious to others when he gets into contact with them. So he's a silent carrier of these normal flora or microbiota. Once again, what are the types? We have the Streptococcus pyogens, we have the Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus pneumonia, we have the Neisseria meningitis, and we have the Staphylococcus aureus. And these are present in uh, 5 to 30 percent, depending on the type of the uh, microorganism or the bacteria from 5 to 30 percent of the adults might be uh, having the uh, these normal flora within the uh, oral cavity and the nasal mucosa uh, once again to continue with the bacterial flora in the normal person in the community mostly it is caused by the staphylococcus species Streptococcus species, especially Streptococcus pneumoniae, or the uh, alpha hemolytic Streptococcus, also the group A beta hemolytic, which is a strep pyogens, also can be part of the normal flora, the Haemophilus influenza, the non typeable Haemophilus influenza, and anaerobes. Patients who get admitted into the hospital or to uh, the uh, intensive care units for a period more than three, four days, then the type of normal flora might uh, change and shift to other types of normal flora, such as the Staphylococcus species, anaerobes, also E. coli, Klebsiella, Candida, and Pseudomonas become more likely to uh, occupy the uh, respiratory system, the upper respiratory tract, and thus patients who are admitted to the intensive care unit might require shift of the uh, antibiotic to be more uh, broader spectrum antibiotic if they are within the uh, intensive care unit or in the a hospital setting or on a ventilator for more than four days because there is a shift of the normal flora into these types. Once again, what are the defenses within the respiratory tract? We have the nasal hair, we have the cilia, uh, the cilia ciliary escalators, cilia which are present in the respiratory tract and uh, which clears the uh, air passages unconsciously and if we get infected with mostly viruses viruses are going to lead to killing of these cilia and as a result of that the uh, respiratory tract is going to lose an essential and uh, uh, an important part of the defense mechanism but the body has another way to compensate for this loss and this is going to be through the coughing. So it's going to, uh, the body is going to respond to the loss of cilia by uh, activating the coughing reflex in order to keep clearing the uh, airways. Uh, 
Also, we have the involuntary response such as coughing and sneezing, and we have the uh, IgA antibody which is present in the uh, secretions. In the lower respiratory tract, we have also the mucus, we have the alveolar macrophages, and we have the secretory IgA as well. Uh, mostly, we said the normal flora is composed of the strep biogens, streptococcus pneumonia, haemophilus influenza, non typable haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitis, and Staphylococcus aureus, and they are all considered as part of the normal flora or normal biota or microbiota. The lower respiratory tract does not have any normal flora and it is a sterile environment. To a lesser extent, we might find the Moraxilla cateralis, the uh, non hemolytic and alpha hemolytic streptococci, cornibacterium, uh, cornibacterium, and other diphtheroids, and the candida albicans to be as a normal microbiota. But mostly these are the normal microbiota within the upper respiratory tract. So we have multiple bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic infections that can uh, infect the respiratory tract. Uh, it represents a portal of entry for the viral pathogens, and uh, vaccination has proven to be very effective in combating and eliminating many of these uh, respiratory uh, infectious agents. Uh, most of the world who had established a good vaccination program, national vaccination program, uh, they have reduced dramatically the number of respiratory tract infection caused by these common respiratory tract pathogens. There are still some parts of the world, the underdeveloped parts of the world, where they uh, lack the resources uh, and they uh, lack the money to establish a strong vaccination program and even people do not have access if they had that vaccination program they do not have access uh, to it easily so in this part of the world we still uh, hear about these uh, respiratory tract infections uh, as a cause of respiratory tracts Pathogens of the respiratory system. Respiratory pathogens are easily transmitted from human to human. They circulate within a community and the infections spread rapidly. And if we want to give an example, these days uh, we're living in a pandemic which is caused by COVID-19. And uh, this is a virus, one of the viruses that causes uh, upper respiratory tract or even lower respiratory tract infection in uh, immunocompromised, in old age, and uh, in those who are uh, susceptible and more prone to the uh, infection with the virus who have chronic uh, illnesses. Uh, we know that it circulates within a community and the infections spread easily, especially with the new uh, variants that are emerging every now and then. Some respiratory pathogens exist as part of the normal flora. We've already talked about that. Others are acquired from animal sources. We call them zoonotic infections. Zoonotic infections are infections where the infectious agent is transmitted to humans from animals. So when we, when we talk about Q fever, it comes from farm animals. When we talk about cetacoses, which comes from parrots and other birds, and in this case, the bacteria is transmitted from the, these uh, birds or parrots to the humans and cause lower respiratory tract infection. So this is the zoonotic infection from animal to human.
Also water, the water system can be a source of respiratory infection. And when we talk about water system, we talk about uh, central ACs, the air conditioners. These central air conditioners might play a role in spreading infections uh, in the uh, con if, the con if the water within these systems is contaminated there with uh, this type of uh, bacteria then it's going to be aerosolized and it's going to be inhaled by the humans and it's going to spread the infection one of them is the legion legionella which causes legion legionellosis which can be transmitted via the central air conditioning systems uh, fungal infections also can or fungi also can infect the upper respiratory tract or even the lower respiratory tract but this is very rarely seen in immunocompetent person it is usually seen in immunocompromised patients and uh, fungal infections are most dangerous when are when they are caused by aspergillus fumigatus or pneumocystis tubericide and as we said, these are more seen in immunocompromised patients. So for example, pneumocystis tuberosi is usually seen in HIV infected patients. Some pathogens are restricted to uh, certain sites, like the Legionella only infects the lungs, but we have other pathogens that can infect, infect multiple sites, such as Streptococcus pneumonia, Streptococcus pneumonia might infect the middle ear, might infect the sinuses, or it might infect the lower respiratory tract, leading to pneumonia as well. So the defenses of the respiratory system, we've already talked about that. Just another reminder, uh, we have in the upper respiratory tract, we have the mucociliary escalator, and we have the coughing reflex, the sneezing reflex, also, we have the uh, secretory IgA, the lower respiratory tract, uh, we have the alveolar macrophages, and we have the secretory IgA, which uh, can interact with the invading microorganisms. So defenses of the respiratory system, once again, we have the mucociliary escalator, which can trap debris and bacteria and get it out of the respiratory system. We have the alveolar macrophages, and also we have the muscles of the chest wall and the diaphragm which can uh, generate cough which can lead to clearing of the secretions from the upper respiratory tract these defense mechanisms might be inhibited by viral infection which can disrupt the function of the respiratory epithelium as we said if virus infection occurs it might lead to death of the cilia within the respiratory tract and as a result this mucociliary escalator function is going to be lost but it is going to be compensated for by coughing and usually it takes 6 to 12 weeks for the mucociliary escalator to get back to the fully functional status uh, seen before the infection a bronchial carcinoma can obstruct the bronchus and infection can arise behind the obstruction so if if the obstruction occurs here then most likely infection might uh, occur in the point after the obstruction uh, because uh, the uh, because the functions the normal functions of the lung are going to be uh, depleted and this is going to lead to loss of the uh, ability of the lung to clear the invading microorganisms and even if treated it's going to be uh, affected as well also trauma or abdominal surgery can affect the ability of the uh, coughing and this might lead to inhibition of the defense mechanism as well. so this is just a tree uh, to show you the types of the bacteria 
uh, that infect the humans and we have them divided into cocci, pacilli, spiral and others or miscellaneous. So if we want to know the gram-positive bacteria, the gram-positive bacteria are divided into cocci and pacilli. The cocci, we have the staphylococcus, and we have the streptococcus, and we have the enterococcus. Uh, the gram-negative, we have the anaerobic, and we have the aerobic. The aerobic, we have the non-spore forming and the spore forming. So the non-spore forming, we have the cornibacterium, diphtheria. The spore forming, we have the bacillus species and the clostridium species. And the bacillus, we have two types. We have the anthraces and we have the serras. The clostridium, we have the perfringus, tetani, botulinum. So this is just a quick reminder for you about the uh, bacteria causes of uh, infection in uh, humans. We're going to be talking about the staph, the strip. We're going to be talking about the cornibacterium. We're going to talk about the pacillus anthracis. We're going to cover uh what else we're going to cover the mycoplasma uh, we're going to talk about chlamydia when we talk about atypical pneumonia and we're going to talk about the Mycobacterium, when we talk about the AFP or the acid fast bacilli, we're going to talk about mycobacterium tuberculosis to be more specific. So these are the major bacteria that we're going to cover in the respiratory system. Bacteria infecting the respiratory system can be divided into groups depending on the infection that they cause, such as those which cause otitis media, sinusitis, mastoiditis, uh, those which cause pharyngitis. Also, in the lower respiratory tract infection, we're going to have, there are multiple ways of classifying pneumonia. One of them is typical and atypical pneumonia. Community acquired and hospital acquired pneumonia is another way of classifying the uh, pneumonia. And Based on the location of pneumonia, we have the lower pneumonia, segmental pneumonia, interstitial pneumonia. This is a third type of classification of pneumonia. Uh, we're going to talk about pneumonia and we're going to talk about all these types of classification for pneumonia. Upper respiratory tract diseases caused by uh, microorganisms. We're going to talk about first the rhinitis or the common cold. So rhinitis, from its name, rhine, which has to do with the nose. Itis is infection of the nose, which is going to lead to inflammation as well. So another name for rhinitis is common cold. Common cold, all of us have experienced common cold and the symptoms are sneezing, uh, sore throat, runny nose, which is uh, the uh, most common uh, symptom of rhinitis and common cold. Symptoms usually begin two to three days after infection, so it's characterized by short incubation period, usually not accompanied by fever and uh, it eventually leads to nasal obstruction and nasal discharge. Causative agents are mostly viruses, and here we're talking about rhinovirus and coronavirus as the most common viruses, or the common cold viruses, we call them common cold viruses, which are the rhinovirus and coronaviruses. And when we talk about coronaviruses, we're not 
talking about COVID-19. So coronavirus has been known long ago since the 1960s to cause mild upper respiratory tract infection in addition to the rhinoviruses and most of the common cold are caused by those two rhinoviruses and coronavirus. Also we have the adenovirus, we have the parainfluenza, influenza virus and respiratory syncytial virus also can cause common cold in adults and children. Common cold is rarely caused by bacteria or fungi. The second type of upper respiratory tract infection is pharyngitis. And pharyngitis is, in, is the inflammation of the throat, which is characterized by pain, swelling, redness of the mucosa, swollen tonsils, and sometimes we might see white packets of inflammatory products or white dots or white patches of exudate on the uh, tonsils and on the pharynx and sometimes we might even be able to see petechial hemorrhage or pinpoint hemorrhages dots red dots which indicate uh, very small points of uh, hemorrhages the mucous membranes may swell and this might lead to uh, impairment of the speech and swallowing uh, this is more often seen in uh, children than adults uh, also this be a, this might be accompanied by foul smelling breath uh, and the incubation period is also short from uh, two to five days differential diagnosis of follicular tonsillitis when we say follicular tonsillitis then we're talking about the type of follicular tonsillitis or pharyngitis type of infection which is caused by bacteria follicular meaning that there is an exudate so there is these white packets or white patches or white dots which represents exudate and these are caused by bacteria most common bacteria to cause follicular tonsillitis is group a beta hemolytic strip which is strip biogens the differential diagnosis when we say differential diagnosis when i ask you to come up with a list of differential diagnosis in this case so We've diagnosed that patient that he has pharyngitis. But the list of differential diagnoses, when I ask you to come up with a list of differential diagnoses, then what are the most common pathogens that can lead to this clinical picture of exudative pharyngitis or follicular pharyngitis or tonsillitis? Number one, more than 90 to 95%, it is caused by strep biogens. Could it be caused by viruses? Most probably not. If it's exudative, no. But is there an exception? Yes, there is an exception, which is the adenovirus. Adenovirus infection might, we might see some exudative material and on the pharynx or on the tonsils. What about candida albicans? Fungus infection, fungal infection. Candida is characterized by forming a whitish coating over the tonsils or the pharynx as we said candida albicans is mostly seen in immunocompromised patients so if you have pharyngitis in an immunocompromised you must think of candida albicans as the cause so the list of differential is strip biogens on top of the list followed by adenoviral infection another virus Epstein-Barr virus also might come as exudative pharyngitis and candida albicans so 
if we look at this picture, this patient has enlarged tonsils, as you can see, edematous and reddish pharynx and tonsils. Also, you have those white exurative patches on the tonsils, which are indicative of mostly bacterial tonsillitis or pharyngitis. Those two figures are used to differentiate between bacterial and viral infections. So in the case of bacterial infection, we can see redness and swelling in the uvula, in the pharynx, in the tonsils, white tissue spots, which represents exudative material, red and swollen tonsils, also throat redness, and we can see the gray fairy tongue. And in this case, the patient might present with foul smelling breath as well. In the viral pharyngitis or tonsillitis, we might see the, the only presentation might be redness and swelling in the pharynx and the tonsils. So the most common mode of transmission is we have here two causes of pharyngitis strip biogens. 1995% of exurative pharyngitis or follicular pharyngitis or tonsillitis caused by strip biogens. And the non-follicular tonsillitis is mostly caused by viruses. Transmission in strip biogens is caused by droplet or direct contact. In viruses, droplet, direct contact, uh, uh, using the patient's uh, personal belongings, uh, all forms of contact with the patient might lead to infection with these viruses. Uh, there are multiple types of virulent factors that we're going to talk about later on when we talk about strip biogens in detail, such as the M protein, hyaluronic acid capsule, and the superantigens. Uh, the diagnosis uh, beta hemolysis on blood agar. So if we grow the, uh, if we take a swab from the uh, pharynx of the patient and grow it on the blood agar, then the uh, strip biogens at present is going to lead to beta hemolysis. And what we mean by beta hemolysis is that as a result of the growth of the bacteria on the blood agar, it's going to lead to hemolysis of the blood agar and turn the color of the agar from the reddish into the yellowish because it's going to degrade or break down the RBCs. Uh, sensitive to pacitracin and can be detected easily by rapid antigen testing, which can be done in the uh, clinic setting and can give a rapid result within uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, diagnosis, it's important, especially in children, to rule out strip pyogens if it's not strip biogens, then it is virus. It's not really important to know which virus because viruses usually cause mild infection, which require only symptomatic treatment. Why do we need to rule out presence of strip biogens? Because if strip biogens, the bacteria, is the cause, we must and have to treat with antibiotics. So if the patient or the child presents to your clinic complaining of sore throat, fever, and once you examine him, you've seen follicular tonsillitis or exudative material on the tonsils. They are enlarged. The pharynx is enlarged, red, and the presentation and examination are with 
follicular tonsillitis, you should treat with antibiotic. If you do not treat with antibiotic and the causative uh, agent is strip biogens, then the child is going to go into complications. We're going to talk about the complications later on, but you should at this stage know that you should treat with antibiotic. Penicillin, cephalexin uh, can be used in case of penicillin uh, allergy. Uh, in case of viral infections, treatment is symptomatic treatment. Prevention hygiene practices in both. And the features, distinct features, generally more severe than viral pharyngitis and exertive tonsillitis. Goes always with strip biogens. We said that other microorganisms such as the adenovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, might lead to infections which mimic strip biogens infection. And we know that viruses or viral infection should not be treated with antibiotic. So what to do in this case? We said 90 to 95% of the cases with follicular tonsillitis are caused by strip biogens. So there's only a chance of five or less percent of these infections being caused by viruses or other things. So, Go ahead and treat with antibiotic, even if it might be caused by the virus. So treating with antibiotic in order to get 95% of the cases which are infected by strip biogens is much better than missing not giving the antibiotic in order to avoid giving the antibiotic to viral infection. فهمين النقطة هون يعني 95% من الكيسز if not more 95 to 97% راح تكون strip biogens. في عنا من 2 إلى 5% ممكن تكون فيروس. الفيروس إذا نعرف إنه مش لازم إحنا نعطي antibiotic. بس في هاي الحالة الأهم if we have follicular tonsillitis, أهم إشي إنك تعطي antibiotic حتى لو كان شاك إنه viral infection. إذا the clinical picture ماشي مع strep biogens أو في عنا exudative tonsillitis, أعطي antibiotic. إحنا already أصلا في عنا abuse لل antibiotic. للأسف معظم الأماكن and this attitude I want from you as future doctors, and never ever to give an antibiotic. For viral infection. If you're 100% sure that this is viral infection, clinical pictures with virus, viral infection, then never prescribe an antibiotic. But if it's follicular tonsillitis, always prescribe an antibiotic. حتى تلقط ال 95 ل 97% من الحالات مش مشكلة انك تعطي ال 2 3% من الفيرال انفكشن انتيبايوتيك. The third type of infection is the sinusitis so we have the frontal sinuses we have the ethmoidal sinus phenoidal sinus and the maxillary sinus infection within the sinuses is considered a type of infection in the upper respiratory tract uh, most commonly caused by either local can be divided into local and systemic in the local a upper respiratory tract infection produces edema of the antral tissue, nasal septum deviation, enlarged adenoids, tumor or foreign body in the nasal cavity. Never mind. What's the most common cause of local sinusitis? Is upper respiratory tract infection caused by viruses? So upper respiratory tract infection caused by virus. Is going to lead to congestion within the nas within the uh, nasal cavity and the sinuses, and as a result, because we know 
that the upper respiratory tract has normal flora. This normal flora is usually present in the oropharynx and the nasal cavity. But once there is upper respiratory tract infection with the viruses, then secretions are going to fill the nasal cavity and the sinuses. And the normal flora is going to go from the nasal cavity into the sinuses and is going to cause infection within the sinuses. Also, we have the systemic, such as allergy during the allergy season in the uh, spring. All, also, we have the cystic fibrosis and patients with immunodeficiency. What are the symptoms of sinusitis? Symptoms are usually nasal congestion, pressure above the uh, nose or in the forehead, uh, headache, uh, toothache. Uh, we might also feel like facial swelling and the uh, location of the sinuses you might feel uh, tenderness if you try to press on the uh, location of the sinuses you might feel uh, tenderness and this could be accompanied with fever or most of the time fever might be uh, missing uh, discharge appears opaque with a green or yellow color in case of bacterial infection. In case of allergy, the uh, color of the discharge is uh, clear and it's going to be accompanied by itching and watering of the eyes. So if there is itchy eyes and the, uh, there is watery eyes, then this is most likely with, even if there is uh, redness in the eyes, this might go better with allergy. What are the causative microorganisms in sinusitis? The most common are the strep pneumonia and the Haemophilus influenza. Once again, when we talk about Haemophilus influenza as a causative agent, we have the typeable Haemophilus, the typeable Haemophilus influenza and the non-typeable. What's the difference between the typeable and non-typeable? The non bubble does not have a capsule, while the tie bubble does have a capsule. So which one is the causative agent in sinusitis? It's the non tie bubble hemophilus influenza. Could be less commonly caused by strip biogens, staph aureus, or moraxella tetralis. So diagnosis, gram stain and culture of direct sinus aspirate. Treatment, we have uh, acute, in case of acute sinusitis, then uh, we might need to take a gram stain and culture of the direct sinus aspirate and send it to the lab. But during this period, we should not wait. We should start the patient on empirical antibiotic therapy. What do we mean by empirical antibiotic therapy? We mean by starting the patient on broad spectrum antibiotic until the stain and culture results and sensitivity come back. And then once we get them back, we might need to shift the, the patient onto a lower spectrum antibiotic according to the sensitivity testing. If we have chronic or complicated sinusitis, we need to obtain cultures and determine the antibiotic uh, sensitivity of the causative microorganism. Otitis externa can be caused by local trauma to the outer ear, furunculosis, which is infection of the hair follicle. So infection in the origin of the hair follicle, mostly caused by staph epidermidis, staphylococcus epidermidis, or Staphylococcus aureus and 
it's a legion within the hair follicle where there is exudate also foreign body and excessive moisture uh, can lead to uh, otitis externa swimmer's ear symptoms are characterized by pain and redness uh, if we have malignant otitis externa, it could be, uh, it's most likely caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Diagnosis through clinical examination and treatment through topical antibiotics. Also, we have the acute otitis media, middle ear infection. It is a common sequelae of rhinitis, or common cold, or upper respiratory tract infection, mostly caused by viruses. So viral infection of upper respiratory tract lead to inflammation of the stachian tube. And it leads to build up of fluid in the nasal cavity and in the middle ear, which can lead to bacterial multiplication in the fluid. So, you remember when we talked about the sinusitis, the same occurs here. Then nasal congestion, uh, also due to the proximity of the stachian tube to the uh, oral, uh, oral, oral and nasal cavities. Then these uh, secretions might reach the stachian tube. And as a result of upper respiratory tract infection, the stachian tube might be uh, inflamed and edematous and in the presence of the secretion this might lead to obstruction of the stachian tube this is not like an air in secret when they're rushing but the middle ear and inner ear still needs to breathe still needs oxygen to breathe and in case the stachian tube is edematous and it's blocked by the secretions then the uh, middle and inner ear are going to use the oxygen which is present in the uh, space within the inner and middle ear and once they consume or use this oxygen this is going to uh, make a negative pressure like mechanism which is going to withdraw the secretions into the middle ear as a result. The middle ear and the inner ear need oxygen. Oxygen will be present in the cavity of the middle and inner ear. Once these organs are going to use the oxygen, راح تاخذه من الكافيتي اللي فيلد ويذ ذا اير هذا الحكي شو راح يعمل؟ راح يعمل عمليه تفريغ او جذب للسكريشنز ويذن ذا ايديميتس اوستيكين تيوب وتسحبها لوين؟ للميدل اير سكريشنز شو فيها؟ فيها النورمال فلورا اللي موجوده في النيزل كافيتيز وبالتالي ذيس ليدز اس تو ذا كوزيتيف اورجانيزمز اوف اوتايتس ميديا في الأكثر الأطفال اللي أكثر من ثلاث شهور والأدلس most commonly are caused by strep pneumonia and hemophilus influenza. Once again, when we talk about hemophilus influenza, we're talking about the non-typeable. So they are the same causative organisms like in the sinusitis. هذول اللي هم part of the normal flora. Less common can be seen in strep pyogenes, staph aureus, and Moraxella catarrhalis. If we talk about the same mechanism, sinusitis and otitis media, then the causative microorganisms are the same in the adults. In children less than three months, strep pneumonia, a group B strep, which can be acquired from the mother, staph aureus and pseudomonas aeruginosa might be causative agents in this case. So the bacteria can migrate along the stachian tube from the upper respiratory tract, multiply rapidly, lead to bus production and continued fluid secretion. So, خاصة بالأطفال إذا الطفل إجانا بأبر respiratory tract infection 
اللي هو موستلي فايرال وعالجناه سيمتوماتيك لانه شخصناه انه فايرال معناته ما بده انتي بايوتيك وعالجناه سيمتوماتيك واموره تمام ما كان عليه حراره بس كان ايش عنده رشحه قويه انفه مسكر ادانه مسكره اموره تمام بعديها باسبوع عشرة ايام the child started to have fever he started to have ear ache then we should think of otitis media symptoms fever sensation of fullness or pain in the ear treatment what's what's the treatment here is it symptomatic treatment no we should prescribe an antibiotic we should prescribe an antibiotic to treat otitis media in this case because untreated or severe infection can lead to eardrum rupture or mastoiditis and might lead to cns involvement even in certain cases the patient might start to have very severe pain in the ear and when he comes to you you might see that there is pus or fluid coming out of the ear in this case he's going to have an eardrum rupture what would you do you're going to send culture and sensitivity from the uh, secretions which are coming from the ear and you're going to start him on empirical antibiotic therapy or broad spectrum antibiotic therapy and you're going to reassure the parents that the eardrum is going to heal most of the time it's going to heal normally and without any bad sequelae So as you can see here, this is a stake in tube. It becomes edematous. So the, you can see that the space in here becomes more narrow. And you can see that this cavity is going to be f filled with the secretions. And the cavity here is going to have air. And it's going to use this air in here, take the oxygen from it as a result of breathing oxygen this is going to generate negative pressure which is going to lead to the uh, withdrawal of the secretions from this compartment into the middle ear and this is going to lead to pressure on the eardrum this is going to be seen as bulging of the eardrum when we do examination for the ear and as i said this pressure might be too strong that might lead to eardrum rupture and escape of the exudate through the external ear canal this can be seen frequently in children but as i told you the Treatment is antibiotic and reassurance of the patient that the eardrum is going to regenerate and close without any sequelae. Strep pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, non typeable hemophilus influenza, and we have the other bacteria. Uh, culture, treatment, amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulinic acid since amoxicillin is 95 to 99% uh, resistant in 95 to 99% of uh, the Jordanian population since amoxicillin are used for everything if you have a headache they used to prescribe amoxicillin in the uh, clinics and hospitals for any reason so nowadays just give the patient amoxicillin, clavulinic acid, or sucuroxine. We have also diphtheria. 
which is caused by chronic bacterium diphtheriae symptoms initially experienced in the upper respiratory tract as a sore throat, lack of appetite, and low grade, grade fever. Corny bacterium diphtheria infection is associated with the formation of a pseudomembrane in the tonsils or the pharynx, and this pseudomembrane is caused by so the infection with corny bacterium diphtheria. There is a toxin release. This toxin is going to affect the protein synthesis, it's going to lead to death of the cells which are infected by the bacteria, and this is going to form a cellular debris or dead cells in addition to the pus, the dead bacteria, and it's going to be encased with a membrane-like, pseudomembrane, membrane-like, or uh, membrane uh, Differential diagnosis of pseudomembrane. So, if we see this pseudomembrane formation, we should think first of all of corny bacterium diphtheria. How common is infection with corny bacterium diphtheria? Very, very, very rare due to the use of the diphtheria toxoid vaccine as part of the DTP diphtheria tetanus pertussis vaccine. Is it part of the National Vaccination Program in Jordan? Yes, it is. When is it given? It's given. Beginning of the third month, beginning of the fourth month, beginning of the fifth month. And it's also given preschool and 10th grade. So due to the vaccination, you would never see diphtheria in Jordan or very, very, very rarely to see diphtheria. Also, we should think of Vincent's angina. And this does not have to do with the heart. Angina here means infection with anaerobic bacteria in the oral cavity, which is called Vincent angina. Also, infection with the Epstein Barr virus which might lead to formation of uh, exerative or pseudomembrane-like, also candida albicans, also adenovirus, also strep biogens. All these might lead to formation of pseudomembrane or uh, exerative material within the uh, tonsils or the pharynx. So this is the pseudomembrane formation caused by corny bacterium. Diphtheria, as we said, this is cellular debris with exudate, with the killed bacteria, and uh, with mucin. Diphtheria is caused by corny bacterium diphtheriae, which is transmitted via droplet contact, direct contact, or indirect contact using contaminated fomites. And what do we mean by fomites? Fomites are the per personal belongings of the patient, like his mug, toothbrush, uh, towels. Variance factors in the uh, diphtheria. We have the exotoxin, which is the diphtheria toxin. Uh, culture and diagnosis, we have the telluride medium where we are going to see a gray blackish colonies uh, prevention of the corny bacterium diphtheriase via the DTP vaccine and treatment we should always treat the corny bacterium diphtheria with the antitoxin plus the antibiotic antitoxin plus the antibiotic Other types of middle or upper respiratory tract infection either we use this or this Herrin into acute epiglottitis, laryngitis and croup are considered part of the upper respiratory tract Tracheitis, bronchitis and bronchiolitis are considered part of the lower respiratory tract If you want to use the classification of upper and lower uh, Okay, let's talk about 
epiglottitis. Acute epiglottitis occurs with an abrupt or sudden onset of throat and neck pain, fever, and inspiratory strider. Inspiratory strider. Due to narrowing of the airways, the patient, once he or the child, mostly seen in children, once he wants to take a, to breathe, then this is going to generate an inspiratory strider. which is a sound, an inspiratory sound, high-pitched sound due to narrowing of the airways, muffled phonation or aphonia and difficulty swallowing or drooling, muffled phonation or aphonia, يعني المريض يا إنه صوته ما في صوت بالمرة أو صوته مش مش مزبوط معجج. and difficulty swallowing and drooling من شدة الألم مش قادر يبلع ريقه وبالتالي he's drooling. this is a medical emergency and in this case if you suspect acute epiglottitis you should never use the tongue depressor or the throat swab to examine the patient. Because if you use them, you're going to lead to more edema and obstruction of the upper airway. And in this case, if we reach this stage, then the only way to save the patient is doing tracheostomy. Is opening into the trachea to allow the patient to take breath from the trachea opening. Caused mostly by bacteria. 90% caused by bacteria and 90% of the cases is caused by hemophilus influenza type B. Here the type of hemophilus influenza and it's type B. Less common is strep pneumonia, conibacterium diphtheria and Neisseria meningitis. Diagnosis via blood culture and the X-ray. If you look here at the X-ray, you're going to see a thumb sign. Thumb sign here. See the arrow like a thumb sign. And this is an indication of narrowing of the airway. So treatment, adequate airway. Humidified air and oxygen. So in this case, the patient should be admitted to the hospital and uh, he should be taken care of. He might need to have an airway inserted in order to, main, to ensure maintaining the airways open then giving oxygen and humidified air, and then starting the patient on the uh, antimicrobial therapy against the hemophilus influenza type B. Laryngitis and croup, sudden onset or uh, a slow onset. Uh, we have either sudden onset or slow onset. It is characterized by Laryngitis and croup. Laryngitis and croup. Croup is laryngotracheobronchitis. So laryngotracheobronchitis, another name for it is croup. Laryngitis is the infection of the larynx. It is characterized by fever. Once again, there is narrowing of the airway, so we have inspiratory strider. And you can go and search for the strider or the different sounds which are seen in the respiratory tract pathology and you can hear each and every sound of them like the strider wheezes crackles also in the patient we can see hoarse phonation and harsh barking cough 
in case of laryngitis or croup, there is fever, inspiratory strider, horse phonation, في عنده صوته متضخم and harsh barking cough كحة قوية If you see a patient with laryngitis or croup presenting to the emergency room you would never forget the harsh barking sound and the hoarse phonation مش قادر يحكي صوته مبحوح على الآخر بنفس الوقت عنده harsh barking cough Croup associated with chest pain and sputum production caused mostly by viruses 90% and we talk about laryngitis or croup mostly we're talking about parainfluenza virus also influenza and adenovirus can cause laryngitis or croup to a lesser extent uh, respiratory syncytial virus rhinovirus coronaviruses all can cause but it is mostly caused by parainfluenza virus uh, we can see also acute bacterial tracheitis, infection of the trachea, and there is pus perilent. Uh, diagnosis, bacterial cause, we, we are going to do gram stain and culture of the secretions obtained by direct laryngoscope, and we can also take blood sample for blood culture. Treatment is maintaining uh, the airway open. I use also humidified air and oxygen and in case of bacteria we might need to use antibiotics but laryngitis and croup mostly are caused by viruses and the treatment is going to be symptomatic. On the chest x-ray due to narrowing of the airway we're going to see what we call the steeple sign. So if we do an X-ray and we see the steeple sign, this is the steeple sign, we call it the steeple sign. Then this is an indicative of laryngotracheal bronchitis or croup infection. Bronchitis and bronchiolitis. Most of the time they spread from upper respiratory tract infection. They are characterized by fever, cough, sputum production, which is clear at the beginning and then it turns into virulent or become exertive. What are the predisposing factors to chronic bronchitis? Smoking for a long period of time. Exposure to environmental pollutants, chronic infections such as infection with TB, tuberculosis, or in patients who have defective clearance mechanism of the secretion, such as in the cystic fibrosis patients. So, in those patients, they might have chronic bronchitis. Acute bronchitis. Patient present with persistent dry cough, rapid or noisy breathing, which we call wheezing. Uh, patient also might have brief pause in breathing. Feeding less and having fewer wet nabbies, vomiting after feeding, being irritable, and here we're talking about babies mostly. Acute bronchitis. They are mostly seen in infants and young children leash and no and the airway passages are so small so if they become infected they are going to become edematous and they are going to cause further narrowing of the airways caused mostly by viruses parainfluenza influenza adenovirus and respiratory syncytial virus it might cause to lesser extent by bacteria such as uh, Bordetella pertussis, Haemophilus influenza, Mycoplasma, and Chlamydia pneumonia. Chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis. The cause of chronic bronchitis usually is endogenous. They use otitis media, with sinusitis, or with positive microorganisms, they are the same. 
اللي هم الستريب نيومونيا ونن تايب بالهيموفلس انفلونزا Diagnosis in this case we take nasopharyngeal specimens are used in direct fluorescence antibody and PCR assay to diagnose the viruses for bacteria we can do gram staining and culture and sensitivity and uh, the uh, positive microorganisms might be mycoplasma and chlamydia pneumonia treatment in this case is a humidified air and oxygen and a specific antimicrobial therapy in case of bacterial infection A number of infectious agents affect both the upper and lower respiratory tract region. Uh, most well known uh, whooping cough, respiratory syncytial virus. Respiratory syncytial virus infect uh, usually uh, children and babies and causes. bronchiolitis and bronchopneumonia causes bronchiolitis and bronchopneumonia we have also the influenza virus which might cause infection in the upper respiratory tract or lower respiratory tract we have also the strep pneumonia which might cause upper or lower respiratory tract infection as well pneumonia is infection of the lower respiratory tract and we said there are multiple types of classification of pneumonia uh, could be classified according to the anatomy. Uh, in the uh, pneumonia, it's an inflammatory condition of the lung in which fluid fills the alveoli. So once the sterile environment of the uh, lungs and alveoli is targeted by the bacteria, then this is going to lead to inflammation and filling of these uh, air cavities by fluid can be caused by a wide variety of different microorganisms, either viruses, bacteria, or even fungi. Uh, can be classified according the ana to an the anatomical position, whether lobar, segmental, interstitial. Also can be classified as community acquired or hospital acquired can be classified as typical or atypical according to the causative microorganisms in the typical or atypical and usually pneumonia starts with an upper respiratory tract symptoms including runny nose and congestion a headache is common in patients with pneumonia a fever is often present in case of pneumonia and the onset of lung symptoms follows via chest pain, fever, cough, and discolored sputum, maybe blood tinged sputum due to rupture of small uh, blood vessels within the alveoli. So the histological or the radiological. Lower pneumonia versus bronchopneumonia, or lower versus interstitial. When we say lower, then infection is localized to a certain loop of the lung. We know that the right lung has three loops, while the left lung has two loops because of the heart is occupying most of the space in the left lung. So, if we say like infection in the right lower loop, this is lower pneumonia. When we say bronchopneumonia, when we look at the x-ray, we're going to see markings which are spread all over the lung, especially close to the bronchus. So, this is called bronchopneumonia. Interstitial pneumonia, we're going to see these vascular markings within the lung tissue. 
Microbial can be classified as caused by bacterial, viral, or fungal. Uh, clinical, atypical, or typical pneumonia. And in a moment, we're going to talk about the causes of typical and atypical pneumonia. Typical pneumonia is caused by bacteria 1, 2, 3, 4. Atypical is caused by 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, epidemiological, it's community acquired or nosocomial acquired. Community acquired, where the source of infection is within the community, spreading between patients or between the population. Nosocomial infection, where the patient is being admitted to the hospital and he acquires pneumonia from the hospital. All have clinical relevance, though no one is absolute. So you can never reach a diagnosis or to reach the actual cause based on this. These are <clears throat> a way of classifying in order to uh, classification of pneumonia in order to narrow the list of differential diagnoses but reaching the diagnosis usually <clears throat> relies on the gram stain uh, culture and sensitivity clinical presentation in case of pneumonia we have cough productive in case of typical pneumonia and non-productive in case of atypical pneumonia, fever, dyspnea or shortness of breath, general fatigue, headache, patient might have nausea, vomiting or even in certain instances diarrhea and he's going to have myalgia or muscle ache. Predisposing factors for pneumonia. So age plays an important role in determining the microorganism which is causing pneumonia. So microorganisms in children differ than those which are seen in adults. Also, COPD, chronic lung illnesses of the lung also play a role in the causative microorganism. Uh, chronic illnesses such as diabetes, heart failure, immunocompromised status, alcoholism, smoking, and also the travel history, occupation of the patient, those who are working with animals, working with birds, they are more prone to infections, with atypical microorganisms. So all these play a role when you take a history from a patient. You should take proper history ask about all these in order to reach uh, reach a diagnosis and try to narrow your list of a differential for the causative microorganism physical signs in case of pneumonia we have tachycardia tachypnea so there is increase in the heart rate tachycardia tachypnea increase in the respiratory rate hypertension Crepitation. Crepitation due to the presence of fluid within the lung, the lung and the alveoli. This is going to have crepitation. This is crepitation like bronchial breathing and fever. Usually when we hear by the stethoscope the, uh, the lungs there is smooth air entry, there is smooth uh, breathing sounds but once there is pneumonia the lung becomes more stiff and the uh, alveoli is filled with fluid so If you try to hear with a stethoscope, you're going to hear the same as if you uh, use a stethoscope to hear on the bronchi. bronchi. So this is bronchial breathing and we have fever as well. Investigation, just x-ray, CBC, just x-ray. We're going to see if the 
infection is localized to a lower segment or it is bronchopneumonia or interstitial pneumonia. <clears throat> CBC, usually we're going to see increase in the white blood cells. C-reactive protein is going to be elevated because this is an acute phase reactant which is elevated in case of infections. We need to uh, measure also the uh, arterial blood gases, uh, sputum culture, blood culture, and in case we uh, think of viral infections, we need to do serological tests, PCR, or antigen testing. <coughs> Sorry, this is a normal chest X-ray, and you can see in the normal chest X-ray the uh, air filled cavities look black on the chest x ray, and you can see the lungs are black, and the uh, borders are well demarcated on the right and the left lung. Here in this chest x ray, what we're seeing is bronchopneumonia which are these markings close to the bronchus and also interstitial pneumonia. Most probably this is caused by atypical pneumonia. In this case, the chest X-ray looks really worse compared to the, uh, to the uh, physical presentation or to the presentation of the patient and the physical examination of the patient. So the patient presents to you walking, that's why we call it sometimes atypical or walking pneumonia. The x-ray looks really bad, but patient's condition is good. He comes to the clinic, he's walking, uh, and his condition is not that bad, but the x-ray is worse. This is the presentation with atypical pneumonia. Here we can see this is right middle lobe pneumonia so this is lower pneumonia right middle lobe here this is left lower lobe infection so this is lower pneumonia once again what are the causes of uh, pneumonia community acquired pneumonia or typical pneumonia Typical, atypical. Typical pneumonia or community acquired pneumonia. Most common cause is strep pneumonia. We have also hemophilus influenza and staph aureus. The atypical causes of pneumonia we have the chlamydia pneumonia, chlamydia cytosine, mycoplasma, coxial, and legionella pneumonia. And all these bacteria lack the cell wall. And they cannot be treated with beta-lactam antibiotics. So they are treated with erythromycin, tetracycline, erythromycin, tetracycline, erythromycin, 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 and rifampicin. Here they are treated with beta-lactam antibiotics. Also, in addition to these types of bacteria, atypical viruses are considered a cause of atypical pneumonia. Typical, strep pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, staph aureus. Atypical viruses, chlamydia, mycoplasma, legionella, and coxiella. Community-acquired pneumonia are caused by strep pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, staph aureus, and Klebsiella pneumonia. Uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia. In the hospital-acquired pneumonia, we tend to see infections with E. coli, with Pseudomonas, uh, with uh, staph aureus, especially the MRSA. MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Uh, 
pathogens, strip pneumonia, it's a gram positive diplococci, uh, almost all sensitive penicillin and cephalosporin, uh, mostly <coughs> sensitive to erythromycin, hemophilus influenza, gram negative coxopacilli, sensitive to amoxicillin, 25% produce beta lactamase. And thus, they are amoxicillin resistant, sensitive to uh, coamoxiclav, cephalosporins, and ciprofloxacin. It is resistant to erythromycin. Staph aureus usually seen after flu, uh, cause severe necrotizing pneumonia in young adults. Uh, treatment floxacillin and erythromycin. And in case of methicillin resistant staph aureus, we need to use vancomycin or linozolite. Atypical pneumonia caused by organisms that will not grow under routine culture conditions. Uh, there is non productive cough, negative culture, clinical signs often do not match severity of a clinical and radiological presentation. Patient, another name for atypical walking pneumonia. The chest X-ray looks <clears throat> much more severe than the actual condition of the patient, as we said. Atypical pneumonia caused by Legionella, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia, and uh, viruses. Also, we have another type of pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia, and aspiration pneumonia is seen in patients with uh, abnormal gag reflex, such as those patients who have altered consciousness, uh, bedridden uh, with CVA. Uh, aspiration pneumonia. So what we mean aspiration pneumonia? Aspiration pneumonia, the uh, gastric contents get back through the esophagus and goes into the lung. And this is going to lead to chemical injury, acid injury, bronchial obstruction, and bacterial infection. Bacteria involved will reflect oropharyngeal flora and aerobes and strep and hemophilus or gram negative in the case of nasocomial infection. Treatment often broad spectrum beta lactamase, uh, coamoxiclav, or piperacillin. Uh, Tazobectam plus minus metronidazole because there might be an aerox. Diagnosing atypical pneumonia, clinical picture. Laboratory culture not likely to be useful because they uh, cannot be grown easily on culture, the atypical causes of pneumonia. Serology detect antibody response, but it usually takes time. Uh, requires demonstration of a single high level or fourfold rise uh, of the uh, antibody titer. Uh, antigen detection, it's a good strategy for Legionella, and uh, we can also use it, uh, use PCR to detect the DNA or RNA of the organism. Uh, potentially, it's an excellent strategy. Uh, Thus, because it gives uh, rapid results within a couple of hours, uh, it's not available in every uh, hospital, especially when we're talking about the uh, public hospitals. Uh, but it is the method of choice in the future. And as we said, as we, uh, we've seen in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the PCR uh, was the gold standard for diagnosing diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. So uh, now the use of the PCR machines and the uh, PCR kits to diagnose bacteria and viruses is becoming more common and it is the future of the diagnosis. Uh, these are some of the uh, microorganisms which cause infection in the respiratory tract and their uh, drug of choice. So when we talk about strep pneumonia, we are talking about uh, benzyl penicillin or amoxicillin, uh, staph aureus flocloxacillin, legionella clarithromycin or uh, ciprofloxacin, uh, Q fever, doxycycline, mycoplasma clarithromycin, and uh, chlamydia pneumonia clarithromycin.
mycin. I think that's all for our lecture today. Thank you for listening and if you have any question, do not hesitate to contact me on the Teams and hopefully after uh, two or three lectures, we might, uh, if you like, we might have a live session uh, where you have gone over the uh, lectures and uh, then we're going to have this live session for uh, questions. Anyone who have questions might send me his question on Teams. Uh, if anyone is interested in a live session, please let me know so that once you have studied the uh, couple of lectures, we might have a live session to answer all your questions. And 